Grant is now fighting a war of attrition. A war of attrition. Just f your willingness to take casualties because you know you can replace them and the other side can't. He wrote a letter to Lincoln, I propose to fight it out on this line if it takes all summer. Unbelievable. But the northern public uh, recoiled from this bloodshed because every day the newspapers are printing casualty lists and reports. And there's a sort of crisis of morale in the North in the summer of, the, in June, July, 18, uh, 1864. Um, because it doesn't seem like he's in, he has accomplished anything. Lee's army is still there. It's, it's diminished, but it's still there. He's not able to break through. Finally, Grant does pull back and he, uh, or pull up, and he heads for, Let's see if we can find it here on our map. Yeah, here we go. These are all the battles of the, of the month, you see. Uh, and he finally circles around and heads for Petersburg, which is the rail junction below Richmond. If he can seize Petersburg, Richmond will be cut off. But Lee gets there first. And so then begins a siege, not direct battles anymore, the besieging of Lee's army, which lasts for nine months. The battles end in June, and now you just have this siege of Petersburg. Grant is the only general who was able to maintain the initiative against Lee and his army, but at enormous losses and uh, without, many people felt, any accomplishment. He's still just now sitting there next to Lee's army. What has been accomplished by these thousands and thousands of casualties? But when Lee sends cavalry under Jubal Early up into the Shenandoah Valley in order to dislodge troops from Grant. Grant sends General Philip Sheridan with cavalry who destroys Early and then destroys the Shenandoah Valley. They burn all the crops and everything they can get their hands on. Sheridan writes back to Grant, a crow flying over the valley will now have to carry its own provisions. There's nothing left. Again, this is what the war is becoming, that the, the, uh, you know, the distinction between civilian targets, military targets, is being erased in the hard war. Nonetheless, as I say, the summer is this low point of northern morale. Sherman is somewhere here in North Georgia, but not making very much progress. Little by little by little, he's heading toward Atlanta, but the Confederates are contesting every, uh, in, uh, every uh, inch of the way, uh, destroying everything in their retreat. Um, Sherman has a wonderful core of engineers. You know, North Georgia is mountainous, and the Confederates blow up railroad tunnels. They pull up railroad lines to prevent Sherman from using that. Um, they have to rebuild it. Sherman's got a whole engineering core. They rebuild as they go along. When the Confederates... Uh, destroyed a tunnel, one northern soldier supposedly said, oh, no, a Confederate soldier said, well, it doesn't make any difference because Sherman carries a tunnel along with him. They'll just put another one in there. But um, meanwhile, in the summer of 1864, uh, one, a strange episode occurs um, involving Horace Greeley, the very mercurial editor of the New York Tribune, who had first, remember, said, Erring sisters go in peace, let them go. Then he's yelling, on to Richmond. Now he emerges as a peace broker. He said, the war is too horrible, too terrible. We should have a negotiated peace. And moreover, there are two Confederate agents in Canada able to negotiate peace, he says to Lincoln. There are two Confederate agents in Canada. Davis had sent them up there precisely to cause this kind of trouble and debate. Link, and so Greeley says to Lincoln, you must send emissaries to negotiate with them. Lincoln, always a little clever, said, you go. Go ahead, Greeley. I'm making you the negotiator. Go up and see what you can find out. But I'm giving you a letter. Here, uh, here I will negotiate. He says, I will consider any proposal which embraces the restoration of peace, the integrity of the Union, and the abandonment of slavery. If they were willing to come forward with that plan, I will accept it. Okay, now that's not, obviously that's not the basis for a negotiated settlement with the Confederacy. Jefferson Davis might have made a clever move by offering an armistice 
if Lincoln rescinded the Emancipation Proclamation. Try to separate union and emancipation, but he did not, he did not do that. Davis was unwilling, he was inflexible, unwilling to discuss. But the, Lincoln's letter saying, here are my terms, end of the war, reunion, end of slavery, gives the Democrats a great weapon in Northern politics. They say, look here, it is emancipation that is preventing an end to the war. Lincoln's insistence on emancipation is making it impossible to end the war. The Confederacy is willing, they say, to come back if you rescind emancipation. And pressure on this issue begins growing. And in August, August 1864, the lowest point probably of Lincoln's presidency, Republicans are saying to Lincoln, maybe you better say, we'll take you back without, with slavery. Henry J. Raymond, the editor of the New York Times and the head of the Republican National Committee comes to Washington and says to Lincoln, direct, people blame the proclamation for the, persistent, for the persistence of the war. They blame the proclamation for the terrible casualties that we are incurring. You're going to lose the presidential election. You are going to lose the presidential election because people blame you for prolonging the war. Therefore, what should you do? You should offer the Confederacy to come back just on the basis of reunion. Now, Raymond says, they're not going to accept that. They're not going to accept that. But at least it will show that you are not the barrier to peace, that they are the barrier to peace. And other visitors discuss this with Lincoln also. Now, at this point, late eight August, mid-August 1864, Lincoln calls Frederick Douglass to visit him in the White House. This is the second meeting of Douglas and Lincoln. The first one had been in 1863, where on Douglas's initiative, where Douglas, remember, had gone to talk about the condition of black soldiers, equal pay, etc. Now it's Lincoln who asked Douglas to come to see him. Why? He says, I'm going to lose. I'm afraid I'm going to lose the presidential election. If I lose, my successor will try to, will probably rescind the Emancipation Proclamation. I believe that any black person who has managed to get to Union lines will be free, will not be able to be put back in slavery. Therefore, he says, I want you, Douglas, to come up with a plan to send what Lincoln calls black scouts into the Confederacy to help run off slaves from plantations to the Union lines. I want you to set up a group that can do that so that if I lose, the maximum number of people have become free. Now, the, who does this plan remind you of, actually? John Brown. John Brown had an idea like this. This is Lincoln's evolution. That Lincoln is now thinking like John Brown. How do you get into the South? How do you get slaves out? A very strange proposal by the president to a guy who's not a soldier or anything. Douglas is no military experience. Douglas does come forth with a plan for Lincoln, but it's for you'll see in a minute, it's not, it's never implemented. But while he's there, Lincoln says to him, People are bothering me about this. I am thinking, he's thinking about it. I'm thinking of sending a note or an emissary to um, Jefferson Davis saying, if you, not saying I'll rescind the Emancipation Proclamation, but I will consider any, any proposal for peace that you put forward without preconditions. And Douglas says, you know, I don't think you should send such a letter. It will be misinterpreted. It will be seen, regardless of how you put it, it will be seen as a retreat from emancipation. We don't know if Lincoln was really thinking about doing it, he was mulling it over. People were pressuring him. But anyway, Lincoln decides that day, the day after, he's not going to go down that route. In fact, the next day when visitors from the Midwest come and talk to him about this, he says, if I promise people their freedom and then rescind the, pro pro uh, the promise, I would be damned in, in time and eternity. I would be damned, and Lincoln was very conscious of his historical image, so to speak. 
reputation. He did not want to be remembered as the man who promised freedom and then took away the promise. But he also says, if I do this, the black soldiers will throw down their arms. Why should they fight for us if we go back on our promise to them? And without them, we cannot win the war. By then, there are well over 100,000 black soldiers in the army. In other words, the presence of black soldiers is sort of serving as a guarantee of emancipation. Lincoln cannot rescind the proclamation because of the presence of the black soldiers.